Make sure to subscribe and turn on the notifications so you can be alerted when new content is released. Enjoy the video. So many of us have heard the term be present or stay in the now. But what does that really mean? Many individuals talk about meditation as a tool to become present. But from a scientific point of view, I want to offer you a new way to understand what it means to be fully present and how you can use your meditation practice to transcend your body, your environment, in time in order to reach the sweet spot of the generous present moment. Let's start with the first question. What does the word meditation mean? Now the word meditation, if you research the symbol in Tibetan, the word literally means to become familiar with. So think about this. Many people quit in their meditation practice because they don't think they can control their mind. Every time you work on overcoming some aspect of your old personality, there's a liberation of energy. And we've measured this on students all around the world because as they keep returning the body back into the present moment, the body is the servant to the mind and just like training any animal, sooner or later it's going to acquiesce. And when it does, there is a liberation of energy and that's available energy for you to use to heal. That's available energy for you to begin to create a new future. Now, the purpose of meditation is to get beyond your analytical mind. Now, it separates your conscious mind from your subconscious mind is your analytical mind. When you're born, you're totally subconscious mind. And we know this to be the case because children's brain waves for the first six years of their life are in a very slow state and it makes them very suggestible to information. In fact, they have no analytical facilities. So all the information that they're exposed to goes into their subconscious mind unedited. For example, big boys don't cry. Little girls should be seen and not heard. Money is the root of all evil. And when children listen to this information without analyzing it, it begins to lay the foundation of who they will become later on in their life, subconsciously. Now, because brain waves are changing and the child is interacting more in the environment, and as the child, by trial and error, is noticing different feelings or different experiences that produce different emotions, when they start feeling new emotions, they begin to pay attention to the cause their brain waves start to speed up and they move into what's called alpha brainwave patterns. And they begin to develop their analytical mind. Now the analytical mind is exactly what separates the conscious mind from the subconscious mind. And as children's brain waves change because they're interacting with their environment, somewhere between the ages of six and nine, they begin to completely form their analytical mind. Once that analytical mind is formed, they begin to divide the conscious mind from the subconscious mind. Now, as we've been saying all along, your conscious mind is 5% of your total mind. Your conscious mind is made up of things like logic and reasoning, which gives rise to your faith, your will, and your creativity. Now, your subconscious mind, as we've been saying all along, is made up of 95% of who you are by the time you're 35 years old. And those are all those hardwired attitudes, unconscious beliefs and perceptions, subconscious habits and behaviors. And that makes up the majority of who you are. Now, the analytical mind is always busy working. The analytical mind is important for us because we need our analytical mind to survive in our life. And because the brain is divided in half, the analytical mind is always weighing past against future, right against wrong, known against unknown. And because the division of the brain allows us to navigate with our analytical mind in our lives, we need it. We need our analytical mind when we're learning new things. We need our analytical mind when we're navigating in our life ethically. 
We need our analytical mind. We need to make decisions and choices that are really important. But when you throw in the hormones of stress and the brain becomes aroused because of the emergency state the brain is in, we become overly analytical. When people are analyzing their lives within some disturbing emotion that are derived from the hormones of stress, and those emotions are familiar emotions from the past, by thinking in the box of the past, they drive their brain further into a more aroused state. And they're moving further away from moving into those subconscious states where they can begin to make change. So the whole purpose of meditation then is to get beyond the analytical mind and enter the operating system where those subconscious programs exist. So then we can begin to take limited beliefs, unconscious habits and behaviors and begin to reprogram them, become more self-serving or more effective. Now you can't change the subconscious mind with your conscious mind. You have to get beyond the analytical mind in order to do that. So some people have a very thin veil between their conscious mind and their subconscious mind. And the thinner the veil between your conscious mind and subconscious mind, the more you are suggestible to information. In other words, just like the child, that information can enter the subconscious mind and begin to have an effect on us. So we want to be more suggestible during the meditative process because we want to accept, believe, and surrender to certain thoughts without analyzing it so we can begin to program our subconscious mind. So then others have a very thick veil or thick barrier between their conscious mind and their subconscious mind, and they're less suggestible to information. And suggestibility is your ability to accept, believe, and surrender to information without analyzing it. So information doesn't pass through the analytical mind as easily. So then the more analytical you are, the less suggestible you are to information. The less analytical you are, the more suggestible you are to information. When you learn how to control your brain waves and move into a state of trance, you pause in your brain and your brain kind of moves into stasis and in that state where you're not thinking and analyzing and you're in a state of trance you're more suggestible to information and you move your brain waves from the thinking conscious mind into a slower brainwave pattern in the subconscious mind it also makes sense that as you increase your brain waves you're all of a sudden increasing your analytical facilities because you're thinking and analyzing more and your brain is less trance and you're less suggestible to information. So in the meditative process, as we begin to reprogram those subconscious states of mind and body, what we want to do is learn the skill, learn the formula, apply the tools to practice getting beyond the analytical mind so that you can begin to make those subconscious changes that become more permanent. So when you're living in a subconscious program, just like a program on your computer, the moment you press play or start, it runs automatically. That's exactly what happens subconsciously. And many people have subconscious programs that are defining their lives, even though their conscious mind wants something else, their subconscious mind may be sabotaging their outcome. So then we have to begin to reprogram that subconscious mind and begin to write a new program. So now that I've laid out the basics of the model of meditation, and how you can transcend your analytical mind, your body, your environment, as well as the familiar past and the predictable future in time, in order to create a new life, shouldn't we be meditating on a daily basis? And we live in two states of mind. We either live in a state of survival, or we live in a state of creation. And living in survival is living in stress. 
And the majority of people in this world spend the majority of their time living in stress and living in survival. In that state, it's impossible to create. 